folks, welcome to another episode of NYC CNC. I am up here in Connecticut. My uh, wife had a wedding. We came up and uh, Junior got to see his grandparents and I had to laugh. We uh, were picked up in uh, Hartford Airport and as we drove out, we drove right by the Mazak North American Technical Innovation Center. It was a beautiful building with all these machines lit up. It was night and you could see them through the glass and uh, got me thinking that uh, now is as good a time as any to start talking about BMCs. Ever since uh, YouTube was around and I started getting into machining you know, 10 years ago, uh, VMCs are just the coolest thing. I thought what I'd do is a short video talking about what they are to me and why I might want one and the process I'm going to, I think, start going for, looking for most likely a used one. And you know, this will uh, bring up a lot of debate, whether it's on this comments in this video or if you go research out there. Uh, uh, on the internet and forums and so forth, it is there's some very touchy subjects, but there's a lot to vertical machine centers that I wanted to get into and what I've learned and start the process. I know I'll learn a lot from the, the feedback you guys uh, offer. I know on the Facebook page for NYC CNC, we've already had some great input on your know, box ways and, and used machines and controllers. So if you're interested in that, hop over to our Facebook page. But you know, starting off, what is a vertical machining center? It's actually not really all that different from the Tormach. They look different, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a giant enclosure around them. But if you look at this picture here, which is a VMC sort of stripped down, you can see it's got the similar X, Y, Z setup, just like a Tormach, uh, but it's also so different. So why am I interested in the VMC now? I'm finally in a permanent location. I'm at a building that can support one, whether it's with the pad or the clearance and the height. You don't want to move these things around, and that's one of the general themes. So, and it's the reason I love my Tormach is my Tormach's not a VMC. VMC, you got to have a service plan. You got to have a pad that supports it. You probably have to have professionals install it and level it. Um, but I'm in a place. I'm either going to have three phase power, or I don't mind getting a, a converter if I need to. I like the fact that it'll have a you know industrial grade tool changer, the, tr the increased travel size. There's a, a diff significant difference in the rigidity of the machine, which has to do with the weight and the construction technique, the t travel size of the mill itself, the horsepower at the spindle, the control of, of the spindle with you know rigid tapping and so forth. Uh, lights out machine, which I, I wouldn't come close to doing, but the idea that you can trust the machine to run uh, certain things and not feel like you've got to sit there, which uh, my Tormach can do as well. I don't like doing that because I don't always trust the coolant system and that has to do with my own nuances to how I machine. But with a high speed, with a high volume flood coolant or programmable coolant nozzles, that's different. And that speaks to why I want to buy a VMC is I, I want to actually leave my Tormach as my main working machine and have that one be something where, the VMC will be something where I will run pre-programmed fixture plates and setups on it. And it's actually a lot less exciting, to be honest, but it's, uh, it's a machine that's sort of better suited for that type of production work. Um, and you know, there's a lot to it. When it goes into rigidity, it's not only being able to take more aggressive cuts, but it's increased tool life. It's being able to maximize these carbide and insert tooling that, that we're, you know, a lot of us are already buying. But honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a science to really get the most out of a tool, whether it's a $20 tool or a $200 tool. Um, so, I don't know when I'm going to buy one, but I've started researching it, I've started paying attention. Uh, like everybody, I'm looking for a deal. I, I see no reason why a guy like me should buy a new one. It's not appropriate, it's not necessary. There are a lot of used ones out there that are great. On the flip side, uh, there's a lot of junk out there. There are a lot of auction dealers that are happy to buy something and, and pawn it off. I'm not an expert. I could easily be swindled because I don't really know a lot of what to look for. And these are complex machines, and they're machines where a single service bill could be more than a whole Tormach. If you crash the spindle, if you've got a ball screw problem, or the spindle needs replaced, you're, you're talking major work. And that goes into one of the most important things that I've read about, which is whatever you end up buying, got to have good service for it. And that may mean you want to end up with a Haas because you know what? The Haas field reps in your area are superb. Or you might not because there's another one that's better. That's important. Um, so running down my little list here of features that I think of, you know, it's travel size of the table. They make small VMCs, but as a general rule, you'll see a lot that are like a 40 inch X and 20 inch Y and 20 inch Z. And the big difference there, you know, X, you know, lots, you know, Bridgeport has a 40 inch X. The difference is the Y. You've got 20 inches of Y and you've got rigidity there, which means that tool is overhanging with the spindle 20 inches from your column and it's still strong. 
Um, you've got the number of tools that you're able to use in the tool changer, and that's important, whether it's you know a small 12 tool umbrella changer or 40 or 100 side mount tool changer. On the controller, how, you know, are you looking for conversational control? Are you looking for a FANUC or a Siemens? Or how are you going to run your G-code and how does that interface? What, what features do you want in terms of the machine? Do you want you know, fourth axis? You know, some Haases are, don't, aren't sold with rigid tapping. You've got to pay for it. It's annoying. Um, but you got to think about what's important to you there. Um, the rapid speeds, it's not uncommon to have 1,000 plus inch per minute rapids. Um, there's tool change time, then there's chip to chip time, and it's one of the coolest things about BMCs is if you look at this video right here, this is a, a good example of, I think this is actually a mill drill machine, so they're known for really, really fast tool changes because they have to do, you know, maybe pilot drills, drill, tap, chamfer, and so there's a lot of tool changes, but this is like a two or three second chip to chip time. That's really fast. Um, I already talked about service. Um, there's these sort of alarms, you know, stay away from XYZ. One of the things I've read about is you want to stay away from the old, like, 1990s Haases. I think there's a, I don't know whether it's an AC servo or I don't remember, but there are some that are a night maintenance nightmare. I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on Haas, although I will in a second. Um, through spindle coolant, you know, are you doing deep drilling or pocketing where you want coolant that actually travels through the spindle through special tools and it comes out the cutting face of the tool and it's uh, I think of it like a gun drill where it's actually flooding from exactly where you want it which is awesome because then you don't need to worry about programming your coolant or where the coolant is going the coolant is always going right to where you want it on the flip side you've now got to buy uh, tool holders and tools that support through spindle coolant um, you know, people in, in big shops evaluate spindle time and how much uptime there is. I won't ever get to that level, but it does matter because if the spindle's not turning, you're probably not making money. So now we're talking about work holding and fixtures and, and quick change fixtures or tombstones, or now some of the VMCs even have uh, features where the whole table slides out of the machine and the new table goes on, and you can be setting up a standard, you know, Kurt Weiss setup offline. Pretty cool. Um, you know, the types of machines in and of themselves, you know, Haas and other companies make small mills, little office mills, tool room mills, they make standard mills, they make drill tap machines, they make giant machines, horizontal machines, they make, you know, tool and die type machines where you've got like glass scales for super, super precision. Uh, there's a whole, you know, subset of different types of these machines. I'd be looking for more of the, the vanilla, you know, 20 by 40 type of machine that's plenty accurate and plenty rigid, but no, it's not what you would use to create you know, large, complex mold, say for, for injection molding stuff. Um, you know, things like chip augers, how do you get chips out? When you run into these really, really big machines, you actually have a problem of creating so much chips and swarf that you've got to efficiently evacuate it. I remember reading on Practical Machinist, a guy had a, I think a Toyota with a D, not, a, not the car company, horizontal machine, a huge, like 70 horsepower spindle, and they were creating I forget what the fact was, but like 55 gallon drums of chips were filling up regularly, like within hours, crazy. Um, and then the, one of the biggest things I think to talk about is the, the design and structure of the machine. And that goes down to uh, the type of ways and whether they're linear ways or whether they're box ways. And this is something I didn't understand when I first got into it years ago. Uh, you know, our Tormox and other common type of machines have dovetails with gibs, so you adjust that and that's what creates the accuracy and rigidity of the machine. Most VMCs will have either boxways, which is a similar to a dovetail in that it's two metal on metal surfaces. So they're very, very, um, they can be very rugged, but you inevitably have to have some gap between the surfaces for oil as they move. They're also much, it's you know, still metal on metal, so you have less speed capabilities. Whereas um, a lot of EMCs now, they're maybe lighter duty, not necessarily, but um, they could be still be very heavy duty, run linear ways. So they're preloaded ways, and that's how you get this incredible speed, like you see here on this drill and tap machine, you know, your thousand plus inch per minute rapids because you've got circulating ball screw screws that are preloaded. So huge, huge, huge amounts of speed. And um, so lots to learn. I'm super excited. It would be really cool to own one. I've got enough work to where I'd like to set up that machine to do certain jobs and then I'll free up my Tormach to do more of our R&D prototyping, uh, smaller runs, which is which would be a great goal. But, you know, I want to find a good machine. You know, I want to try to find a $100,000 machine used for 30 or 40. We'll see if that happens. 
not necessarily in a rush, but uh, I'm sort of actively looking and learning. And I thought it would be fun to kind of share uh, the more as I learn and, and start looking at machines and trying to figure out what's a good deal and is it close enough to make it worth my while to have it rigged over to my shop. And uh, also I wanted to hear from you guys on, on advice. It's, I know it's a touchy subject. For instance, Haas. You know, everyone loves to beat up on Haas. They're very, very popular. They spend more on marketing dollars than probably the next 10 companies combined. I made that up, but they spend a lot on marketing. And uh, I'm hearing from people that the new Haas machines are great. They are incredibly well built. They don't have the same uh, you know, lack of rigidity. They're not made like toys anymore. But you know, something that bothers me is Haas still grossly over-exaggerates their spindle horsepower when it comes to the ability to generate that horsepower at any continuous rate of duty. It's kind of like your you know, $50 five horsepower shot back. It's, it's BS. So it's a shame that Haas does that because it sounds like now they are producing a really good machine. Uh, but I think I'll generally try to stay away from a used Haas for that reason. I'd love to find a Mori or an Akuma or a Mazak uh, or an OKK. Uh, you know, those are all good Japanese machines. And I thought what would be funny to end the video with is there are so many players out there. So here is a list of all the machines manufacturers that I could come up with just sitting down with a pencil. And I'm not a, in this industry. I'm not a buyer. I've never really been to big trade shows. There are a lot of players out there. There's probably a hundred more than here, uh, but you get the point. It's a very uh, competitive market. There's a lot of players out there. There's a lot of features. So uh, I'll be back with another episode on this when I learn more or have something to share, but I thought it'd be fun to kind of start off this process with thinking about what matters and uh, we'll see what we learn and hopefully you guys learn something as well. So from Connecticut, I will uh, see you guys back uh, this Wednesday for the widget. Take care, folks. Thanks.